So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in Praxis uh, 2018. And Amit Prabhu, the team, Promise Foundation, reputation today, wow. I haven't seen such a large, Mahakum was the right word. I haven't seen something like this ever. And I think our gathering, I truly feel that some of the fraternity that you see here, people who can really move mountains, a lot of unsung hero heroes here, so I think a large hand for all of you, and of course for Amit. It's a subject close to my heart, and it's a subject that shaped the persona of ITC over the last couple of years, over the last two decades, really. And therefore, it will be a pleasure to speak on some of the stories on sustainability. And as I do this, I am deeply aware that there are companies here in this audience, a lot of them who are sustainability champions, who've done great work. I know some friends from Mahindra here. I saw someone from Aditya Birla, the Tata's Infosys, great companies and great work that has been done. I'm going to share a few stories from ITC because that's where I've been closest to the action. And that's what I would like to share with you in the next couple of days. Next couple of hours, sorry. Sustainability means a lot of different things to different people. Some see it as CSR, some see it as green, environmental issues, and so on. For us, it's been a very inseparable part of our DNA. It's really a part of core strategy in IDC. And that's really some of the stories for very small stories. We've got 100,000 stories to tell you, but that's not enough time to do it here. But certainly four stories which should give you an idea about what we mean by sustainability. But before that, just a couple of days ago, a friend of mine, a batchmate, sent me a brilliant visual and said, isn't this something that you do? So this was it. And uh, isn't this about greenwashing, you know, when the whole world is falling apart and you talk about sustainability? And here you are, a company, a conglomerate, $50 billion, doing food, person care, hotels, agriculture, paper, paper boards, and of course, a traditional business of cigarettes, and you talk about sustainability. So is this what it's all about? So this is the challenge that many of you would have felt in terms of telling sustainability stories to someone who's very skeptical. A lot of them are, and all of us who've been in this profession for a while know this. There's always questions as to why you're doing this and so on and so forth. And so this uh, is what one of the reasons is that a lot of sustainability today, this ticker is going so fast. Uh, a lot of sustainability today is a bolt on to the main strategy of the organization. It's not really the bedrock of that strategy. It is not what is the deep DNA of that company itself. And one of the reasons why people are so skeptical is perhaps because of that. So I'm going to share with you a couple of stories really which give us our insights, not really tell you what we are doing, but some of the great transformation that can be done when sustainability becomes a core part of your business. So the first one, well, a little bit provocative perhaps, when cutting trees solved an insurgency problem. It's about this state, the state of uh, Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. Now, not very far from here, well, about five hours, we have in uh, Bhadrachalam, India's largest paper mill, India's number one paper mill in Bhadrachalam. Uh, it's, it's, it was, uh, it's today one of, it's the number one, but 20 years ago, we wanted to shut down this plant. And the reason we wanted to shut down this plant, despite it doing what it was, is because there was no excess to pulp. Now, as you know, the government did a very right thing of saying you can't cut trees, right? But then where does pulp come from? You need paper for education, you need paper for packaging, and thanks to Amazon, now you need more paper for packaging. So where do you get paper from when you can't cut trees? So the government again did a great job and said, well, we're going to allow you to import pulp from the rest of the world where they grow plantations at almost zero import duty. So our managers were very happy. It's almost like a landed cost zero and doing business as usual. But we decided not to do that. And one of the reasons was that when your farmers, when millions of farmers here need their jobs and livelihoods, by getting plantations outside, I'm exporting those jobs when I, you need it most here. So we spent 10, 12 years 
researching how to grow trees. Now, India has 33 million hectares of wastelands where nothing grows. So we wanted to grow trees because you can't get agricultural land to grow trees because we've, we've got competing demands for land, food, fuel, fodder, forests. So no one's going to give you your land, food, agricultural land to grow trees. So we had to grow trees in wastelands where nothing else grows. And therefore we spent 10 years to even understand trees and we developed 125 types of trees which could grow fast, four years instead of seven years. Now, if I'm going to tell you that your first income is going to come in after seven years, are you going to do that job? I don't think so. So we can't tell the farmer that wait for four years for your first income. So we had to create things which would happen fast, would use less water from the soil and so on and so forth. And this is what we gave to tribals in Telangana here. And the first slide, thank you for that. This region was known as the Red Belt of Telangana. Many of you would know this. Naxalites, Maoists, insurgency. They had land, corporates like us cannot buy land, agricultural land. So we took these saplings, we gave it to them, we helped them clear their wastelands, put up those farms, and every year those trees kept on growing. So every year they would plant, there was logging activity, there was a whole lot of people who were involved in this, and today you have forests. Next door, and some of you who might like to visit someday, I'm sure, would like to go and see it. Today you have forests like this. So this is not planting five days, five trees on a World Environment Day. It's a whole forest. Not one, not two, but millions of trees. We use one, and for each one that we use, classmate stationery, packaging, classmate is number one in stationery now, we plant three more. So there is always a green cover. And because of this green cover, not only is ITC carbon positive now for 13 years, India's greenhouse gas emissions have come down. That's the scale of things that's happening here. Forests where there were barren wastelands at that point of time. We've been trying to tell this story uh, through various ways. And uh, today, those Naxalites that you saw, the next generation is now going to college. This guy is an engineering student. There are 2,54,000 farmers of this sort. When we take people on the ground, we said, please meet any one of them, because all of them have stories, right? And today, uh, when we looked at what's going to be next, we said, okay, this is your plot of land. If you're going to grow trees, what happens to agriculture? India is going to be 1.5 billion people very soon. So when we walked around the world, they said you cannot grow trees and agriculture together because the shade will not allow things to grow. We had to look at innovation inside to see how both can do it. And today, you have more than one lakh acres where you're growing both agriculture and food, doubling those farm incomes in, in around, around this place. So again, farmers gaining in terms of livelihoods as well. So again, as I said, we've been telling this story in different ways. But the most important thing is we could have imported pulp. We could have created the same paper, perhaps made more profits. You know, you're still number one in paper, but it doesn't mean that I could have gone, I could have made more money out of that as well. But we greened about seven lakh acres. I was in Paris during the climate change talks where they asked us to present this, and someone in the audience said, what is this 600,000 acres? And someone did calculation on the mobile tree and said, this is 23 times the size of Paris city. That's the amount of forest that has been created. And if I had just imported pulp, we would have got 600 people in that plant we had. But by doing it this way, you created employment for 125 million person days of employment. That's what India needs. So also, we created a huge impact in terms of the green cover and holding the topsoil so that things could grow. And for us, even though I need 20,000 acres in that sense, you've got so much more multiple, seven lakh, and it became a competitive source of wood pulp. So a, comp so a plant we were shutting down, you're laying off people, 100,000 people. Today it's become number one and one of the largest in this country. And not merely by just a business model, but really looking at how society and environment can work together. That is the story that we've been trying to say, and to hear some of that, 
బట్టలు కూడా మాకు కరెక్ట్ గా ఉండేవి కావు పిల్లల బడి పంపించాలంటే వాళ్ళకి ఎంత మంచి బట్టల పుట్టిందా అన్న మాకు అది కూడా ఉండేది కాదు అప్పుడు వ్యవసాయం ఏదో జొన్న పప్పు ఇవన్నీ చల్లేవాళ్ళం కానీ అవి ఎన్నిపోయాయి మామూలుగా మన ఐటీసీ ద్వారాగా మొక్కలు ఇస్తే ఆ బంజారు భూమిలో వేసాం మరి ఇది పండించడానికి ఫస్ట్ మొదటి కారణం ఏంటంటే ఐటీసీ మాకు సలహాలు సూచనలు కూడా చాలా చక్కగా ఇచ్చేవాళ్ళు మేము గత ఫస్ట్లో నమ్మలేదు ఉన్న బంజారు భూమిని పంట భూమిగా మారచడానికి వాళ్ళ సలహాలు సూచనలు మాకు చాలా ఉపయోగపడ్డది అనేసి అనుకుంటున్నాను నరికిన తర్వాత మాకు అప్పుడు ఎనభై వేల దాకా వచ్చింది ఆ ఎనభై వేల ఎనభై వేలు అయితే మేము ఎప్పుడు చూడలేస్తా ఎనభై వేలు చూస్తే మాకు ఎంతో ఆనందం అనిపించింది నెక్స్ట్ ఇయర్ వచ్చేసారి కూడా అగుమడులు వేయడానికి ఎక్కువ రైతులు చూస్తాం ఉంటాయి ఎట్లా అంటే ముందు చూడలో వేసేస్తా మొక్కజొన్న వేస్తాను గ్రౌండ్ వేయడానికి చాలా వేసాను చేస్తా అంటే బ్లాక్ వేయటం వల్ల ఏంటి అంటే మనకి దగ్గర రావాలి అది ఒక సంవత్సరం కూడా వ్యవసాయం చేయాలి లేదా మూడు సంవత్సరం నాలుగు సంవత్సరం కట్టింగ్ వస్తుంది we also did a campaign last year to talk about this not just the jab kisano ki zameen banjar hoti hai unke bachcho ke school sunsan hote hain roll number 1 present teacher roll number 2 present teacher roll number 3 present teacher roll number 4 present teacher banjar zameenon mein humne kagaz ke liye khas paudhe lagaye kisan hue khushal aur schoolon mein bacche aaye ped badhte gaye bacche padhte gaye उन पेड़ों से हमने कागज कॉपी बनाई और उन किताबों ने बच्चों का भविष्य कौन कहता है कि रेगिस्तान में फूल नहीं खिलते जब हम इकोनॉमी एनवायरमेंट और सोसाइटी को साथ लेकर बढ़ेंगे तो देश और आगे बढ़ेगा आईटी से सब साथ बढ़े now one of the reasons that uh, we did this and that is really when we said about cutting trees was to change this whole mindset how many of you receive a mail where it says don't print this because it'll kill the environment or raise your hands you yeah, almost everyone do you realize that if you don't cut those trees those guys will go back to becoming nexolites there will never be a green cover so the story was not just about cutting it was about growing i went to uh, the it industry in bangalore because they said we're never going to use paper cups anymore because we cut 1000 trees a month so we asked them why aren't you planting 10000 trees a month they said well no one told us that because we only said that don't cut trees don't cut trees don't cut trees no one said grow trees so the whole idea was to change that mindset to growing trees which not only created which you today if you look at that red belt maoism it's the only place in the world where without military intervention there is no nationalism anymore and economic prosperity has happened right thank you so you not only did that you replenish the environment you also create a jobs those 125 million jobs and itc became number one this is what we call a win win the triple bottom line economic environmental and social so while all this was a nice to do thing some time ago sustainability for us today and many others in the room it's no longer nice to do it is a need to do and the reason it's a need to do is for various reasons why sustainability is done the world has really moved last 50 years 77 trillion dollars world economy what has happened 62 people 2 years ago this is 2 years ago in davos world economic forum 62 people own the wealth of half of the world what happened last year this 62 became 8 today 8 people in the world own the wealth of 3.6 billion people in the world those people hate you because you've got the jobs you got everything else that's where unrest happens that's where everything happens in the world which is not right and in india the problem is worse and i put that picture of that yacht in the mediterranean because you know on the same mediterranean you've got yachts today not yachts boats which people running away from their own countries because of strife you only get to know when a small child is washed away on store on shore there are 500000 people waiting outside europe to get in and it's a reality of this because of this inequality and if you look at it in india the problem is worse because you've got one third of the world's poor 
So therefore, the need to create jobs and livelihoods is much more. For a company like IDC, it's very easy to create the most modern plant in the world and have no people. But it's very important that we need to create livelihoods across the value chain. Another important reason, that today with 17% of the world's population, India has only 4% of water and 1% of forests. Now it's long gone when we can say that, you know, close that tap, put off those lights. We need to replenish resources on a much larger scale. Now how do you do that? When it's not a business case really in that sense. And now you've heard about the Earth Overshoot Day, 1st of August this year, and this date has been moving like no one's business. We exhausted the resources that we had for this year, all of us collectively. So what are we doing from August 1st to 31st December? You're snatching it away from your children. It's very simple. I finished my resources on the 1st of August. Till 31st December, I get my resources from my children. So when I'm tucking them away at night saying I love you and I sleep, I'm actually putting a nose on their throat to kill them. 2030 is the date for a barren planet. We always thought climate change was a long time ago and I'm going to show you something on that as well. So for us in ITC 20 years ago when we talked about sustainability, it was a fact that business cannot succeed in societies that fail. I can have the best brands, I can create the best brands and the best strategy in the world. But if societies don't win, and we don't make societies win, businesses don't win. And that is one of the key issues that we wanted to put here. So therefore, how do you do this? Yes, we have to be extremely competitive. Today, everyone's here in every, from everywhere in the world to India. You have to be extremely competitive to be globally competitive in that race. Being competitive earns, gives me the right to be able to do other things for environment, for society, and so on and so forth. But the first pillar is competitiveness, and I say this because I'm going to say something about that later and how we miss this sometimes. And this extreme competitiveness has to be done by creating jobs plus looking after the environment, something in ITC that we call responsible competitiveness, and something that has really driven that triple bottom line, economic, environmental, and social. So this credo is what we call Let's Put India First in ITC, which has driven everything that we do in the company with this entire thing that you have there, country before corporation and the institution before the individual. If there is an opportunity for me to work for someone else in terms of improving their lives, I would do that. So country before corporation and institution before individual. The next story, the first one we saw on sustainability, when the grandfather, the last time they saw crops was in the grandfather's time. This is a picture from Ramnagar, Nasinkara, Madhya Pradesh, two years ago, when we had gone there, acres and acres of land which are barren. Farmers telling you that the last time we saw crops, those guys in front, were during our grandfather's time. Reason is there's no water. Farmers don't know what to grow, when to grow, because the market works on last year's prices. You know why farmers commit suicide in agriculture? Because last year onion prices were high, so I grew onions. This year I realized that there's a huge amount of supply, and I can't sell, I can't even give them away free. So what do I do? I've got debt. I go and hang myself. You read it in every day's newspapers. Climate change for India is here and now. We are an agricultural company. When we go to our 40,000 villages, I spend a lot of time in those villages. Things today are at a critical list. 54% of the country is water stressed. So you need to create agricultural practices, you need to create water. So for us, 20 years ago, when we launched the ITC Chopal, which is today taught in the Harvard Business School and 400 universities across the world, the whole idea was to empower the farmers. A lot of you who've heard about this only see the front end. Yes, we brought information technology to farmers 20 years ago, much before the internet was as big. Yes, we had to create those VSATs and give them information. Price discovery around your, where are the, where are the prices going? The idea about weather, because I buy fertilizer, put it onto the ground, and tomorrow there's rain, and the whole year's savings go off. So a whole lot of things was done in the local language, uh, which we put through the computers. No electricity, so solar panels, and so on and so forth. And today, it's grown much more, because farmers need to know how to grow things. From this same piece of, our land is not going to grow in India, right? How do you grow more productively? Our people are growing, 1.5 billion people, how do you feed them? Right? So you have to be much more sustainable, not only sustainable, you have to look at it from an environmental perspective. 
Today, Delhi was shut down three days because of rice husk burning in Haryana. Zero tillage like you do that actually increases the promised productivity without doing all of that. The solutions are not rocket science, but we need to do it. So when we did this, we also had to create infrastructure for them. The front end, when, when the farmer's income went up, they needed places to buy. And who says that you cannot have a mall in rural areas? You don't need to have a farmer who does not have convenience and choice. So not just our products, everyone else's as well. But the back end was interesting. Today you'll see news everywhere that grains are rotting. When we have production as well. That's because farmers don't have storage. They need to take it to the mandi and sell. And when you take it to the mandi and sell, many a time it has to be a distress sales. So what do you do when you have a situation? We created huge barns, right? Number of times you can use them because the government also locks in and said you cannot do this. That's another story. But the idea of putting this also helps another brand creation. When you have segregated things which come in, identity preserved wheat, for example, it's because India has different rotis. Now, this we know because we have hotels everywhere, ITC hotels, and it's made from things like this. When the farmer goes and dumps everything, you cannot do any differentiation because it's all blends. So Ashirvad Atta, which is today a market leader, was because it's a blend of 18 types of wheat. North India has a different roti, South India has a different roti. Right? So how do you customize, mass customization? Right? That's what made IT, the Ashirvad brand where it is. And today, whether it was in the trees example or in farmers, none of them we have a contract with. He can sell, she can sell to my competitor. But that's the trust we give because we are a fast-moving consumer company. What do I look for? Loyalty of our consumers. And that loyalty has to move to my supply chain as well. So they are free from selling to us. And many a year, we don't get things from them, even though we've done everything there, whether it is the trees or whether it is agriculture. Farmers take a social oath. This is far more important to me than a piece of stamp paper, which is a contract. Where do you take this poor guy to a court? But this gives him a pride in that village of doing something for ITC. So some of those stories, again, uh, we've been sharing. And today, sorry, there's something. So today, about 4 million farmers have used the Ichapal, some of the products, the whole value chain which drives that. As these products grow, uh, also things are, are driving in that chain. <laughs> जब हमने गांव-गांव में ईचापाल शुरू किया, किसानों को मिली अच्छी फसल और सही दाम और देश को कल के किसान। जब हम इकोनॉमी, एनवायरनमेंट और सोसाइटी को साथ लेकर बढ़ेंगे, तो देश और आगे बढ़ेगा। आईटीस सब साथ बढ़े। Again the same thread which drives all our business, सब साथ बढ़े और let's put India first। I told you about water and I told you about 54% of India being water stressed. So we have to do huge amount of work to get water right inside to the villages. This is large watershed work across, and today you have about 12,000 odd structures across India. And I just wanted to tell you what does this structure mean, because when you talk about rainwater harvesting, people look at the small play thing that you put up somewhere in a housing colony or somewhere. You need to see the watershed that we've done. Guess where this picture is from? Any idea? A quick one. Kerala. Kerala. It's Bundi district in Rajasthan, where there was, it was a desert, there was no water. This is one of those areas we did watershed. So when we go to these places, you find barren land. Uh, can I have the pictures somewhere? I don't know why. Uh, so the, when the rain comes, it takes over the topsoil. You can see that thing being dug. So when you create these dams, you get five kilometers of water. Five kilometers of water gives the farmer three crops. Now, many places when I used to go India abroad saying that five kilometers of water, they said, you know, you PR and corporate communication guys will put any number to anything. So I had to take a drone, really take it to the site and said, let me show you what this watershed is. This is not a river. This is, again, near Nasinkara, a whole watershed, please. My drone, actually, this is at a 4x speed of the drone. I had to bring back the drone because it ran out of battery after about two kilometers. 
And uh, this feeds into about 300 villages, hundreds of thousands of families. So when the rain goes away, this is what provides the uh, water for the second crop and the third crop. And that's how they're. So this is, again, not just a river. It's a man-made watershed. So 12,000 structures like this, not all of them like this, much smaller than this as well. But that's what you've created to be able to get moisture and soil to about 9 lakh odd acres that we do today to improve agriculture. So we're not just going to a mandi and buying stuff for our food products. You're actually creating a life, transforming lives for those farmers as well. These are run by water user groups. You talk about gender diversity, you may need to go and see things there. People don't come into these meetings, they find them 100 bucks. Right? But this is how they run that entire water system. That's the water story, and then you have to do much more. I'm not going to get into this, there's no time. But you need to do a 360 degree in those places. Animal husbandry, when there's a flood or a doubt, the animal runs. The farmer runs away with the animal. That's the only source of life. So when you created that, I mean, this photograph I love because when you went to this guy, it was five members in a family, one meal a day, one small hut. Two years later, after we did animal husbandry, he's bought a car. His wife bought us jewelry from, from absolute poverty, right, to this level. 17,000 of those farmers in, in that area, and again, worth seeing their lives because the greatest satisfaction that I get from all of this is meeting those people and seeing how their lives are transformed. It's an amazing feeling. A lot with women entrepreneurs as well. I saw this lady, ultra poor women that we call, who are women-headed households. Husbands have deserted or they have died. So this lady, I remember in one of those villages, they said, this is my house and I couldn't see it because there were four bamboo poles with a gunny bag on top, three children below. And I said, what do you eat? They said, you know, I do this chalni work at someone's house, whatever falls on the floor, I eat and I bring to my children. That is life for millions of women as well. So when we started doing this work with Bandhan, the NGO as well, we started telling them how to do livelihoods and so on and so forth. Last a couple of uh, weeks ago when we went there, this lady came who had this sari worn the other way and she had plucked eyebrows and stuff like that. And it happened to be this lady and she said, you know, she runs two beauty shops. She runs all sort of other things from that. And then you had this 20 journalists with me. You know, the, the whole, at the end, she took out a scooty and went away. One and a half years from eating that, picking up on the ground, to being depend, to completely being independent. That's what we want people to be. That's what we want the ultra poor women to be like. So work on 50,000 women right now and increasing as we talk about it. So this is what really, when you go to villages and hear this, really feels, gets very encouraged. Today the scale is this. And I don't need to tell you that this is huge because we support about 6 million livelihoods right now. I've had presidents of countries who've told me that my entire country is 6 million people. How does one company do it? But I don't want to, this is a whole issue of how you embedded sustainability into the core business model. You have to think sustainability at every point of time to be able to do this. And for us communicators, the job becomes easy because you've got thousands of stories. There is feeling here, there is passion here, there are things that you're seeing there. So communicating, if I can't do it, is my failure, not the stories there. The next one about Hillary Clinton, which again I love, not 15 minutes from here, we've built a, a new hotel in, in, uh, in Hyderabad, one of the iconic ITC hotels, like our signature properties, our best of cuisines and, you know, service delivery rooms, whatever. But for all our hotels, for many years now, we've followed a credo called responsible luxury. It kind of sounds like an oxymoron because with that kind of luxury, how do you make it responsible? But we thought, A, those are huge buildings, how can we make it green buildings? 
B, how do we source materials? How do you get food? How do you encourage the whole value chain to be able to do things which can look very luxurious and is luxurious and you pay tons of money to do this. But at the same time, I create both livelihoods, create an environmental signature as well there. So when we created green buildings, it cost us more. But today, you have about 30 odd green buildings in this country. Yeah, she said two minutes, so I'll stick to that. 30 green buildings, and because of that, there's a center in Hyderabad which will tell you this. Because of the green buildings that you built, the entire India's footprint on green buildings went up. India is now second after US in green buildings. This applause is all for us actually in India because you know we can do things of this sort. So today, if you look at the ITC Grand Chola in Chennai, run 100% on wind energy. We have five hotels like this which are run completely on wind energy. So we don't tell our guests, put it at 23 degrees. Don't use this, don't, because we do the things at the back to be able to give you luxury, because that's what we are selling here. And for many years, you talk about communications, we tried to talk to people about why green buildings is important, no one listened to you. Till Hillary Clinton, when she came, she heard about this in the US, and she came to one of these buildings during her first visit as Secretary of State, and this is what she said. The tour that we had, the information that we were given, uh, certainly underscores the importance of the ITC commitment and the partners who worked with ITC. Uh, we know that uh, there are wonderful monuments throughout India, uh, from the India Gate to the Taj Mahal and so many others. But today we are at another Indian monument. The ITC Green Center may not be a regular stop on the tourist map, and no one would confuse it with the Taj Mahal. But it is a monument in its own right. It is a monument to the future. And that is the most important monument. As we were taking... I'm not going to run the whole thing because there's short on time. I have one more small thing to show you before we do the interaction. We created a lot of Indian brands, and it was important because when you stand here and say, I'm proud of being a Samsung for Korea, 20% Korea, of GDP is from Samsung. You create an Apple. When do you create Indian brands? As Indians, don't we have to feel proud of the brands that we create for India, which retains more value? So when we did this, there are a lot of brands which have those value chains, some which we create new. So how do you give them a social message? And this is going to be hopefully my last video here. There were some insights. Maybe you can take it up when we are... So this is something that one of our soap brands pushed uh, to identify with a social cause. Bhaiya, aap is sunsan gali se nahi, seedha long cut se lijega. Bas yaar, one more year of work and then marriage and settle up. Tu hota hai kya chal raha? Haan. मीडिया से हूँ सिंगल हूँ लेकिन आपको कोई प्रॉब्लम नहीं होगी नो लेट नाइट नो मैन नो लाउड म्यूजिक और रेंट भी हमेशा टाइम पे दूंगी स्लाइड फिफ्टी थ्री चेक किया क्या मीटिंग में रेड लिपस्टिक लगाएंगे भाई मैन आई नो यू एंड अरविंद बोथ वीपीज नाउ बट द सैलरी स्ट्रक्चर कैन नॉट चेंज It's HR policy. I hope you understand. चलो अभी सब मेरे साथ बोलेंगे मम्मी जी की रोटी गोल पापा जी का पैसा गोल मम्मी जी की रोटी गोल पापा जी का पैसा गोल अभी हंस ले यार कल से तो तू तेरी बीवी की शॉपिंग बैग से उठाएगा Everyone is staring. Jeans ही पहन ली होती है यार समझाओ कुछ उसे बच्ची नहीं रहेगी वो लड़कों वाली हरकतें छोड़ के घर के काम काज में मदद करें यस ये आवाज है एक समझौते की एक आदत एक दौर एक तरीके की ये आवाज है औरत की खामोशी की उससे रखी गई हर अनुचित उम्मीद की ये आवाज है हम सब की और इस नाम बोल के भी हम सब चुप हैं अब 
उसे बोलने दो अब समझौता नहीं so that was how we that's how i disagree over the last 20 years it's a growth machine that's still moving i don't know how many agencies i'm going to require how many corporate communities i'm going to require because the stories are all over the place and i think i'm not doing as much justice as i should do to all of them 80% of our value goes to the government out of the 2 lakh crores that we value added 1.5 lakh crores went to the government not too many people know this and in the last we become the only company in the world to be carbon water and solid waste recycling positive as we created this as well i won't get into the awards uh, just finally since we're going to end i had a few insights to cover i know that he's already stood up uh, a few key ones sustainability can be a powerful communication if it's part of your dna that's why i call it the dna code the top leadership of itc spoke about this in agms in every possible function that you could think about for 20 years before we got here results the scale was very important before rhetoric strategy thinking much more about communication strategy than what we do not really looking at crisis coming in today something else happening tomorrow really looking at how am i going to use longer term i could explain a lot more but we don't have time people are the heroes not me it's not itc doing it it's those great people on the ground who did things and it's not about itc the more we share i know that it's going to be a more we we created institutions like the ci center for sustainable development to spread this message and finally reputation is an outcome i certainly believe our communication professionals need to follow need to create competitiveness as a pillar for the company not just talk about the outcomes we are far better than that we need to create those strategies for the company which can go ahead and finally the message is important not as much as the messenger if you remember cameras went from this to the mobile phone but the memories remain the same music went from those old radio that i had to this great streaming machine but that melody doesn't change the truth is in the message that is the purity of the message and as long as we can convey that message not only for our company to make a better world for you for me and for the future generations that's when i would be feel proud to stand here and speak for you thank you very much um so i think you have done so much it's very difficult for me to even you know address a question at this point in time but i'll start with a very recent announcement where uh, the prime minister has kind of made a very robust claim about you know uh, we getting eliminating plastic by 2022 um, what do you have to really think do you think it's possible yeah i think it's a very far sighted uh, move because if you look at today what we do if you look at the sheer numbers we do some 1.3 lakh tons of garbage every day municipal waste and out of that about 20% is plastic and out of that 20% another you know 5000 odd which is a very small part is what is called multi layer plastic which you see littered everywhere you know biscuit packets and chip packets and all that stuff so that's more visible the point about garbage and municipal waste is that whatever can be recycled is recycled there's a huge organization which works on this and there's a whole lot of things which happen but for us we did this program called wellbeing out of waste which we today reach out to about 77 million uh people and uh, the the whole thing was of collection now the problem is where does this problem of waste happen none of our houses really to a large extent have segregation so when you put waste wet waste and dry waste together it is completely impossible to re recycle it later because it's very difficult to collect and do it so the entire thing starts with awareness it starts with source segregation today there are a lot of recyclers available but if the garbage goes out of my home in a way that i cannot even touch it in a plastic package which have food inside so if we are going to do source segregation it can be assured that a lot of that plastic would have gone out anyway india is the only country today where 60% of our plastics are actually recycled so this is one of the only countries which does this and it's a it's a global uh, benchmark there but when we looked at all of this we realized the importance of homes and the importance of people to do it on their own homes now if you look at new delhi coimbatore bangalore hyderabad some of the places where we have done this you will find that the vats no longer have uh, garbage because the wet waste is going for compost the dry waste is going to recycle they're building roads with it they're building furniture but it starts with source segregation and therefore this whole awareness by the prime minister is very important 
it's, it's only when you flag these issues that you go deeper to find out how can we do this. And, and really, it's a great initiative, and I'm sure a lot of companies like us who committed on that day when Prime Minister announced it uh, is, is really looking at completely a place where we can do we, Our plants are already zero waste free. We'd really like to see our cities looking much cleaner as well. Just to add to that question, do you think we are infrastructure ready to kind of really take such uh, and workforce also? Because I feel that's a bigger question mark when I actually read about it. See, we did this in, uh, if you look at the examples, one in Bangalore and one in Muzaffarpur in Bihar, both of them had completely diametric infrastructure. But both of them did it and they've gone up in the Swaj Bharat rankings quite a lot. So the point is, I certainly feel we can do it. The whole point is collaborations and partnerships and really looking at what is making. See, a lot of suggestions come that, you know, you must put print currency on the plastic packet so that they can return it to the shopkeepers and so on, so that someone picks up that. But can you imagine you're just shifting the garbage point from one place to just the shops? You're not solving the problem. So how do you really look at a long-term solution? I think the infrastructure is there and can be created. As long as you can create a business out of it, and that can only happen when there's end use for recycling, and that will happen when you do source segregation at all. So, um, very interestingly, you've been speaking a lot about the whole business connection and the business ideology which is connected to every initiative you have undertaken. What would be your advice to the young companies and the startups especially because uh, they are dreaming big and they want to go really you know, far and beyond? Uh, how do, should they really think about sustainability and uh, responsibility at this point in time? See, it's, a, it's one thing to preach and another thing to do and I know how difficult it is for that person who is creating an entrepreneurship and doing something. Even in our own companies when we do, because it's, ITC has been a company of startups in terms of new brands, you know, all the brands that we saw in the last 10, 15 years. We have never burdened a new brand with the entire sustainability issues of the world. We said that let it reach a level of maturity. But something like a Vivel that you saw, how do you create awareness, public education, how do you create through social media a lot more awareness, it may not be a huge cost, but whether it is education, whether it's about women issues, whether it is about girl child, there are lots you can do. So you can certainly, and these guys are very smart, they, they use digital technology a lot, they know how to do this. And certainly it will help a lot if the startups at least look at creating awareness, spreading that message, and knowing that when they grow, they need to look at sustainability not as an afterthought, but really look at how it can shape their business, because it's my feeling that tomorrow consumers will demand this of whatever industry that you're in, right? So therefore, once they start embedding that thought, that strategy in the first place, I don't think we can burden them in the right, in the first instance to do a lot of things, but at least getting that thought in their strategy that this is a part of business, that's when things start moving. And I think, as I said, they can do lots more for awareness building as well. Uh, so uh, a connecting point to that is that uh, uh, as we are growing, uh, how do you identify? Should I be identifying by passion or should I be identifying by business? You know, of course, we had to look at what is called participatory appraisers to really find out what the problems are at one level, really look at what the national priorities are and find solutions. That's why we took environment and poverty. But I think it's a call which depends on the type of business that you're in. Are you in education, finance, are you in food, are you in whatever, and therefore to do things that you can do where your knowledge comes in. Because one of the important things is not just your money. In most of our cases, it's not really the money which is doing things. It's the manager resources who are on the ground at that location, who know things, who are able to do things. So it's a contextual of what your knowledge is, what the country needs, and really finding a good fit between the two. Uh, uh, as I was speaking to you earlier also, we're working with a technology company who measures sustainability. And uh, we have, uh, you know, taking very small steps towards, you know, getting the awareness right, but we still kind of fail at times. What is your view in terms of the integration of technology in terms of measurement of sustainability? I think it's very important and it all depends on what kind of work today, for example, when you see some of the things, when we talked about carbon sequestration and so on and so forth, requires a lot of technology. Green thing requires a lot of technology. A lot, actually, which drives this is on the consumer. Now, the day the consumers demand sustainability, right? And if there's a trust mark today which someone develops with a measure, a metric, which can measure your triple bottom line, your, your performance, and people can do an enlightened choice while buying a product or service, that consumer force would be so powerful 
that everyone will think sustainability because it will become a value proposition. Today, the markets don't really care. And that's one of the reasons why it's still there. But you know, this is a progression. And I certainly believe there will be a time when both markets, there is a movement already, but it will become a force at some point of time. Um, now I will ask more from a communication perspective. Uh, you've been the other side of the uh, chair, so uh, when agencies come and kind of are participating in the pitches for sustainability in the projects you undertake, uh, what is exactly that you at times look for? Because I have been part of you know many uh, sustainable projects and uh, pitches. It's a difficult task to decipher it. It's either led by too much of emotion or it's led by too much of uh, growth strategy. But what would be your advice? You know, it's very interesting because we work with some agencies who have been pretty new and they've done great jobs. And I think at the end of the day, sometimes there's a great idea, but there's no implementation. You really look at how someone can give you a great idea and really have the power to transform that on the ground. But more important, understand the client and really understand where my passion lies and what is it that I'm going to do. Because you know, people gave us very cliched solutions that, oh, this is what works for trees and this is what works for water and this is what... There are out-of-the-box things which come to you. And you know that those guys don't have the capacity sometimes to do things. But yes, I mean, that strikes a chord. We have given uh, work to a lot of people of that sort and we're pretty happy. So there are advantages of large organizations because you've got so much of skill sets available and sometimes you need to go with them if the, if the job at hand is something of that sort. And sometimes you really need to go to someone who has the right idea but perhaps has not been able to get an, uh, an outlet for that idea. And we will certainly look at how much they understand us because that's the key part. I spent hours doing briefings for them uh, to tell them about a story because you need to feel us. We take them to the villages, we take them on the ground. Because unless you feel for it, sometimes you can't really talk for it. Uh, taking inspiration from what Sri was saying, you're sitting on a bank of stories and uh, it, there's just every day one story for coming up for you. How do you think digital is going to kind of help in terms of the, event, the amplification I of think, sustainability? I think it's going to play a large role. And uh, that's where I've been asking, I need more and more people to come and make this story come to life. And certainly uh, some of them are 20 years old and you sometimes worry that they'll die off because you won't see that place. You know, I, I took a journalist once uh, who called up and said, you know, send me to this village, but there's no poverty here. So what do I shoot? I said, look, if I've been there for 20 years and there's poverty, that means I failed in my job, right? But you know, that's the kind of uh, thing which happens. So I, I, I and really, it's again one of those things where I said you need to really, yeah. yeah. Uh, my uh, last question would be in terms of, uh, you know, uh, is there an aspect of commoditization which is happening with uh, communication of sustainability and responsibility? Uh, because uh, I have gone uh, on ground talking to a lot of tribal and rural guys and they're smart people it's not that they are foolish in terms of what they're talking about uh, are the brands understanding their language correctly and what should we actually be doing about it you know you're very right I think the smartest lot is there they're the most hardworking they're the smartest they know what is ailing them what do they need and what they should do uh, we haven't really kept our ears open as much as we need to do and some of my younger colleagues uh, who are very, uh, you know, as they say, I need to see the result today and now uh, spend more time on their tablets looking at this instead of talking to them. I think we need to do that much more. And I think there is some amount of also lots of good work happening to tell those. If you'll see some of those stories, we didn't actually create those slick stories there. It was their stories. And I've seen that that is what gets us much more traction then really employing someone to put the right music and the right lights and the lights, everything else. So to that extent, I think uh, it's important to listen. It's important to do a lot of inciting. We've really gone 360 degrees sometimes in terms of strategy, or at least 180 degrees to be able to go from here to say that we didn't understand you well and it shaped communication that way. I don't think we've perfected it. I think we also commoditize it as much as anyone else. So you're also at fault because there's a deadline and you create something soon. But there are great stories and I think they need to be told. Thank you so much, sir. I think it was very insightful being part of this journey. Thank you so much.